So this presentation, we're going to do a few things. All right. Um, number one, and, and once again, the name of this presentation, um, should African Americans celebrate European holidays, the history of Christmas. Okay. We're going to do a few things. Number one, uh, understand the pre-Christian uh, origins of Christmas. A lot of people celebrate Christmas, but don't understand the pre-Christian origins of Christmas. They don't even understand the Christian origins of it, but especially the pre-Christian origins. We're also going to understand some of the symbols of Christmas, okay? We're going to understand the role that astronomy plays in the celebration of Christmas as well. A lot of people don't know that astronomy is involved in the celebration of Christmas, okay? They don't know about that. Uh, we're also going to deal, uh, look at the Christian influence as well. We have to look at the pre-Christian era, then look at the Christian influence, uh, the um, uh, second, third, fourth, fifth centuries, and, 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 and on, okay? We're also going to deal with why Christmas is celebrated on December 25th. A lot of people don't know why Christmas is celebrated on December 25th, so we're going to deal with that as well, and look at uh, some of the economic impact on Christmas also, all right? So it's my goal to, uh, we're here, we're, we have this place till 7 o'clock, uh, so we'll, we should be out of here uh, before then, hopefully, okay? And we're going to take a break also about 4, 4, 4 30, something like that, and we'll take a break as well. All right, whenever I do uh, presentations, I know I'm going to cover some information that's going to be outside the circumference of some people's awareness. I know I'm going to say some things that some people have never heard before, okay? And uh, so usually when I uh, do my presentations, I usually say uh, something like this. Uh, this. The space inside this circle represents my realm of knowledge. Everything that I think I know about whatever I think I know is represented within the circumference of this circle. I must keep in mind that there are still things to know that exist outside the circumference of my own awareness. I usually have people put their fingers together to form a circle, okay? Because I know I'm going to say some things that people have never heard before. But just because you've never heard it before does not mean it's not true, okay? It just means you have to go do some research to determine the validity of what I'm talking about. All right, now, when we look at the um, festival of Mithra, okay? Mithra was an ancient um, sun deity amongst the Persians. Now, the Persians also influenced the Romans. Not only were the Romans influenced by the Greeks, and when the Romans uh, conquered Egypt, they enslaved some of the Greek philosophers and had them to, to teach them. Not only were the Romans influenced by the Egyptians or the Kemetic people, but they were also influenced by the Persians. Okay, now, uh, Mithra is an ancient sun deity uh, uh, amongst the uh, Persians, and his celebration was uh, from uh, December 25th to January the 1st. Okay, and January the 1st, you have the Festival of the Calends, K-A-L-E-N-D-S, the Festival of the Calends. And during the Festival of the Calends, this marked the first day of the first month of the New Year. Okay, for us, it's New, Year, it's New Year's Day. Okay, they had this celebration, the Festival of the Calends, and from the word Calends, we get the word calendar also. All right, and um, actually, the... Um, where calendar, it, it comes from the Latin, uh, mid, medieval Latin word calendarium, K-A-L-E-D-A-R-I-U-M, calendarium, which means money lenders account book. And according to the way this evolved, um, the, uh, those who kept the books and had people that owed them money, things loan money out, things like this, they would keep track of the money and uh, they would keep track of it, and what, what they kept track of it in was, was called a calendarium, okay? And it would also have in there when this loan comes due, things of this nature, okay? So when you start studying the history of this holiday, you start getting into the culture of the people who influence different traditions, and then you start getting into the root words of, uh, of uh, the root uh, words in their language, things of this nature. So it takes you in a number of different directions also with this, okay? All right, now, um, Christmas is celebrated on December 25th. We have to look at the winter solstice, okay? All right, so, how many people are familiar with the winter solstice? One person. I know you know my name. Okay, anybody else familiar with the winter solstice? Wave your hand. This is not a quiz, I'm just asking, okay? Okay, <laughs> only if you, you, you are familiar with the winter solstice? Uh, it starts around the 21st. Oh, wait, you right up there on the screen? Yeah, but, I'm, <laughs> but before this, <laughs> were you familiar with the winter solstice? Yes. Okay, all right, now, to understand why Christmas is celebrated on December 25th, we have to understand uh, something about astronomy, all right? Now, um, first of all, 
we all know that the Earth rotates around the Sun, right? right. Okay, remember that from fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade. Okay, right. the Earth sits on its ax axis on a 23.5 degree angle, all right? And the Earth rotates on its axis once every 24 hours, all right? This is where we get our 24 hour day from, okay? The Earth also rotates counterclockwise in the celestial path around the Sun. So everything is moving. We have stars moving, the Earth moves, the Sun moves, things like this. Okay, so a lot of people don't realize this because we don't feel the Earth moving, okay? But the Earth rotates around the Sun also. For one complete rotation around the Sun, it takes 365 days, 5 hours, 48 minutes, and 45.51 seconds, okay? 365 days, 5 hours, 48 minutes, and 45.51 seconds. This is where we get the calendar, the one year calendar year from. It's called a solar year, okay? This is where this comes from. Now, um, when we look at the four seasons, they're, they're, made, they're made up of uh, three months each, okay? And they have to do deal with astronomy. In this, how many people have seen this book here, The Life of Christ? How many people, well, you've seen that. I've showed it in my presentation before, okay? Okay, this is from the American Bible Society Presents the Life of Christ, all right? I was at CBS uh, Pharmacy um, back in, I think it was November of last year, okay? And I was, um, let me see something. Yeah, I was in the CBS Pharmacy in November of last year, and I was doing, uh, I was standing in the checkout line. Okay, I was standing in the checkout line, and... I saw this book, because I always pay attention to my surroundings. I saw this book called The Life of Christ. It's from the American Bible Society, as you see. I brought it with me so people didn't think I made this up, did some Photoshop, changed the words around. No, 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 this is, this is in here. And I was looking at it, and I said, wow, $12. And the name of this book is The Life of Christ, Rediscovering How His Life, Death, and Resurrection Changed the World. Yeah, we're back to streaming, so bring that back up so I can see what's going on. Okay. All right. And I was flipping through it. And I came to page 55, and I was blown away by what it said on page 55, okay? And on page 55, it says, it says this here, let me turn to it. All right. It says, why December 25th? This is actually page 55 right here. It says, why December 25th? It says, we don't know the actual date of, of Jesus' birth, but it most likely wasn't on December 25th. In Christianity's early years, people debated when Jesus' birthday should be celebrated. Some Christians were against observing it at all as they didn't want Jesus compared to Pharaoh and Herod. Okay, so the mythological character of Pharaoh that they talk about in the Bible but never tell you the name of Pharaoh, they're talking about that here. Uh, Pharaoh and Herod whose birthdays were commemorated. So back, in, back during this period of time, some people didn't celebrate birthdays because they said it was, it was vain to celebrate birthdays. Other people did. So you had this debate going on. But in the 4th century, Pope Julius I made it official. Christ's birth would be celebrated on December 25th. December 25th was already considered the birthday of the sun. Using the technology available at the time, ancient astronomers observed that on December 25th, the day started getting longer again, just like we talked about. Okay? They recognized the date as the winter solstice when the sun is born again each year. The Romans celebrated the birthday of the god Sol Invictus, which means unconquered sun, okay, on December 25th. This day was also recognized as the birthday of Mithra, the sun god of the ancient Persians. And we talked about Mithra at the beginning, okay? And also as the birthday of Attis, an agricultural god worshiped in Asia, Asia Minor. By choosing December 25th, the church avoided upsetting the masses. No one wanted their festivals canceled. So the church simply combined the new Christian holiday with pagan traditions. Okay? So this is in, and I'll pass this around. Take, you can take a look at this. Just make sure I get it back. This is uh, from the American Bible Society. So they're dealing with history here. Okay? Now also, uh, incidentally, uh, Pope Julius I, it was in 336 AD that they first celebrated what's known as the Festival of the Nativity, which would later be called Christmas. And they said this is when this will be celebrated in 336 AD. In, 330, in 345 AD, this is when they declared that December 25th is the birthday of Jesus the Christ. Now they had nothing historical to base this upon, 
but they based it because of the celebrations of the other sun deities they were on or around December 25th. This is where this comes from, okay? So you can take a look at this here. You can, write, you can, you can order this from Amazon. It's no longer at CVS Pharmacy because, you know, they only have it on the stands for so long. But you can, um, you can order that. I check. It's, it's, it's available on Amazon.com. You can check that out, okay? All right, now, now how many people knew this information here? Raise your hand. Okay, you already knew? Okay, all right. All right, so, and you can go do more research on this. I tell people, you don't have to take my word for this, okay? Go do your own research. All right, now, um, and what I have to do is lay the foundation so that then we can deal more with the pre-Christian era then go into the Christian era. I'm trying to do, I'm trying to follow things chronologically as much as possible. But because there's so many influences, it's, it's hard to just go one, two, three, four, five. But I try, I'm trying to do things chronologically here. When we look at the Festival of Saturnalia, just give you some more information on that. Uh, now, in Rome, the winters in Rome were not nearly as severe as those in Northern Europe. Okay? So even though they uh, had their winter festival, it was, it was, it was different. Okay? Um, the festival of Saturnalia was in honor of the god of agriculture, Saturn. So it wasn't a sun deity. He's dealing with agriculture. Uh, beginning the week leading up to the winter solstice and continuing for a full month, okay, sometimes a full month, other times from December 17th to the 20th, December 25th, depending upon which period of time you're dealing with. Saturnalia was a hedonistic time when food and drink were plentiful and the normal Roman social order was turned upside down. For a month, slaves would become masters. Peasants were in command of the city. Businesses and schools were closed to everyone. Okay? Uh, businesses and schools were closed so that everyone could join the fun. Also, during this time, during some periods of history, when you study the Festival of Saturnalia, they would have orgies as well. Okay? This is, this is, huh? Yeah, this, this, this is part of their history also. They would have orgies. This, I mean, and I don't mean food orgies, I mean sexual orgies. Okay? They would have, this was going on then also. All right? And this is one of the reasons why. Um, the, the Christian church is going to change some things, and also when you deal with certain periods of history, which we'll talk about, Christmas was banned uh, in Boston, uh, in England, during certain periods of time because of the hedonistic practices of what later became known as Christmas. All right? Now, also around the time of the winter solstice, Romans observed what's called Juvenalia, or the Festival of Juvenalia, a feast honoring the children of Rome. In addition, members of the upper class often celebrated the birthday of Mithra, which we talked about, the god of the unconquerable sun or the sun deity, on December 25th. And um, okay, and for most Romans, uh, also Mithra's birthday was uh, a most sacred day of the year. We have to understand that for the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire is steadily expanding. Okay, you have a Western Roman Empire, and Eastern Roman Empire, and as they conquer people, they the, the people are practicing different traditions. And what you're going to see to bring people into Christianity, to cut down on revolts and things like this, they're going to incorporate various practices from different cultures of people that they're conquering. They're going to incorporate these into Christianity, okay? And which later and becomes Christmas, all right? Um, and, when we, and when you study the history of Easter, you'll see this incorporation also as well. Okay, I don't really have time to get into that right now, but you'll see that as well. Mm -hmm. Anybody have, okay, brother had his hand up. Yeah, what's, uh, go ahead, brother, what's your question? Yeah, you were talking about ISIS. Uh-huh. And, uh, you know, uh, let's see, I'm thinking about uh, Michelangelo in mm -hmm. Europe. Oh, yeah, the Sistine Italian Chapel. Was, he was painting, yeah, the 16th Chapel. Mm -hmm. And that's when they were making that transition into the colors because uh, they, the, they wanted that silly painted white instead of with blacks. And, uh, that well, yeah, this, this, these are some of the early depictions of Adam and Eve as white, uh, of, the, of the different biblical characters as white. He used his relatives as the images of Adam and Eve. Um, yeah, this is where you get uh, a lot of that coming from. And what they're doing is they're going to use image to change the way that people view religion. They're going to use, and they're going to use image ultimately to conquer people's minds, conquer the way people view a lot of different things. Okay, so they're going to take control that, of that. that transition was made uh, so during that time that us in black, uh, you say the ISIS was colored from uh, from black to uh, white. Well, well, and, uh, when, that when, was exhibited as Jesus holding, well, when, holding Jesus, because it was looking similar to that particular 
art form. Yeah, you, you're going to deal with different influences. One thing I was showing was this superhero known as Isis, who comes out, the TV show was in the 70s. Uh, I'm not sure exactly when she was created, but I was talking about this here, the Black Madonna and Child, which is still worshipped in various parts of Europe today. If you look at some uh, books, if you look at some works from Renoko Rashidi, uh, usually I bring his book, Black Star, The African Presence in Early Europe. I don't have it with me today. But in various parts of Europe, they still have the image of the Black Madonna child. Okay, that's ancient. Okay, uh, and, then you, and then it's going to transform into this European depiction. Uh, the Pope still worships the image of the Black Madonna and child to this day. Okay, a lot of people don't know this. But if you start doing research on this, you'll start finding this out. Okay, now this is a lot of information that's hidden. Uh, another thing is uh, when you look at the Moors, we're going to get to that in a little bit when we talk about uh, Black Peter or Joata Piet, okay, Black Pete. Um, if you, uh, throughout Europe, they have statues of the Moors, they still have paintings of the Moors, and even, uh, and I'm going to show you this also, we can skip over to that quickly here, even the uh, the Greek island, uh, I'm sorry, it's an Italian island, not a Greek island. The Italian island of Sardinia right now has as their national flag a, a flag with four Moors heads on it, four Africans. This is right now, okay? This is, uh, this is how it looked from 1999 up until now. Before 1999, instead of the bandana being over the, uh, above the eyes like a headband, it was over the eyes, symbolizing that they had been captured and they were prisoners. Okay, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the history of the Moors because you have to because when when you deal with it, it's very hard to give you really adequate information without giving you background information. So I could come up here and do a one pager and talk about Christmas and Santa Claus things like that, but you won't really understand the information. So when you start dealing with this history is going to involve other areas of history and take you in different directions. So in this presentation, I cover a lot of that. Hold on just a second. I'll come back to you in just a second. Okay, now also, the national flag of Corsica, which is a French island in the Mediterranean. Sardinia is, a, is an Italian island, not a Greek island. It's an Italian island uh, in the Mediterranean. Corsica is a uh, French island in the Mediterranean. It's under French rule right now. Their national flag is this right here. Another Moors here. Okay, and the Moors, in, in addition to them being in Spain and Portugal and Italy and Sicily, Crete, Austria, Germany, France, things like that, they were also in these islands. And the reason why they have them as uh, on their national flag symbolizes these Europeans defeating the Moors, okay, and then enslaving them or pushing them out, okay. So that was a monumental task for them to take back uh, these portions of Europe from the Moors. Uh, and also with this one here for, for uh, Corsica, um, originally it was the bandana was over the eyes, symbolizing they had been conquered and they were a prisoner. Okay, to make it more euphemistic, they show it as a bandana now, and you see the more with the earring also. Okay, which a lot of Moors, male Moors, wore earrings as well. And this is something we're going to deal with when we get into uh, Joata Piet or Black Pete as well. Okay, I mean people for me were Black Pete or Black Peter who's a sidekick of, of, of Bishop Nicholas or St. Nicholas coming out of the Netherlands. I mean, people, okay, I'm going to show you some information on that as well. It's going to blow your mind, all right? Now, and I'll come back to you in just a minute. What's your name again, brother? Uh, Will. Will, okay, I'm going to come back to your question in just a minute. You can Google Sardinia right now or when you get home. It's going to come up with the official page of Sardinia, from, from, and it deals with traveling Sardinia and all types of things like this, all types of information on Sardinia. And I'll Google this. I, I did this in preparation for one of my recent interviews with Renoko Rashidi. How many, people, how many people are familiar with Renoko Rashidi? Okay, he's, he's written many books. His latest book is uh, Black Star, the African Presence in Early Europe. And those who listen to my show, when this show is over with, you can listen to the podcast of uh, the interview I did with Renoko Rashidi a few months ago. And anybody here, when you get home, you can listen to the podcast of the shows. Uh, go to blogtalkradio.com forward slash the African History Network show. blogtalkradio.com forward slash the African History Network show. We have uh, the show's podcast that they're going back, I think about two years, okay? Uh, over 50 episodes. And also, if you have iTunes, anybody have an iTunes account? You download music, things like that. The shows are archived on iTunes. You can download them for free. These are like three and four hour shows. Okay, so you can download them from iTunes. All right. 
But in preparation for my interview with Renoko Rashidi, I did some research on Sardinia. And on Sardinia's official website, on every page on that website, pretty much in the upper right hand corner, you'll see an emblem that looks like this, okay? Because this is the national flag. flag. Now, the emblem is very, very small, and it just looks like a decal, okay? If you don't know what it is that you're looking at, you'll think it's just decoration because it's so small. But if you, uh, you can go to answers.com and type in Sardinia, look at the information over the right-hand corner, it's gonna show you the emblem with the four Morris heads, and it'll show you the flag. You can click on the word flag, it'll blow it up and show you this picture here. Okay, so this stuff is real. A lot of people don't know this, but this stuff is real. And it's on their website right now. Okay, back to your question, please. Yeah, so I'm curious because who came up with the psychology of the ideology of uh, color because at that, that point, that, that, that set the stage for color because they still went about changing all the colors of the different statues and, the, and what they represent. In fact, they went as far as in Egypt, they shot off the noses of the pharaohs because the noses were pugged and everything. So who's the psychologist behind this, this method? So, well, it, come, it comes out of European white supremacy and later racism. Now, the myth is that the nose of the Sphinx, known as Herr uh was shot off by Napoleon, but that's a myth because in Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization by Anthony Browder, he shows you drawings that predate 1798 when Napoleon goes into Egypt to invade and the nose is already deteriorating then, okay, in the various pictures. And you, you see a gradual de deterioration of the nose. When we look at various artifacts uh, coming out of Kemet, we see a lot of the nose, nose is broken off. It's, it's, it, it's thought that some of that is deliberate, but other can be by accident because in moving, the, in the various movements of these statues from one place to another, the sacking of Egypt, things being stolen, since that is an extremity, it can be broke, it's easier to be broken off, okay? So some of that is probably deliberate, all, all of it being deliberate, probably not. But with the Sphinx, that is, that's a myth, okay, about Napoleon, Napoleon shooting that off. Um, okay. Well, history said, from my history, mm -hmm. it states that Marco Polo did that when he was over in Genghis Khan. Then when Genghis Khan, uh, Khan was learning about, uh, well, uh, you know, about uh, bike practice and learning how to make explosive uh, mm -hmm. devices. And uh, they, they came to Egypt and they saw that he had his men shoot the noses off. Them, so. Okay. okay. They, they, they probably shot some noses off. And as different groups go into Egypt, they sack Egypt. Uh, um, the, the Greeks, the Romans, the Persians, the, the Turks, uh, the French, um, the British, they're going to sack, uh, over hundreds of years, they're going to sack Egypt, steal artifacts, destroy uh, artifacts, and it's, the destruction is still going on today, by the way, also. In, in, in Egypt right now, uh, see, because the, the majority of the people who control Egypt today are Arabs. So the pyramids, the temples, the artifacts, that has nothing to do with them. Just like, so they don't have a connection to that. The, big, the biggest asset that that has to them is a tourist attraction, okay? The, the, so those, uh, and what they're trying to do is slowly destroy the evidence of African history, of African people. Um, you have various uh, carvings in the pyramids, things like that, where they put plaster over, okay? They put plaster over various depictions of the metal net and things like that. The metal netter is the ancient writing of the of the Kemetic people. Kemet meaning the land of the blacks. Some people say the black land, uh, who, who they call the ancient Egyptians. Because these people that are there today calling themselves Egyptians, these Arabs, these are not the ancient Egyptians. Okay, these are invaders to the land who come in uh, 7th century AD, around 639 AD, conquering 642. And uh, in, uh, according to most accounts, uh, they start enslaving, they start the Arab slave trade of African people in the 8th century AD. And this goes from the 8th century up until the, uh, about the 19th century, okay? So, uh, between the 8th century and 19th century, these Arabs are gonna take out somewhere between 30 to 50 million Africans in, 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 into the Arab slave trade of African people, okay? Not only did they have an Arab slave trade of African people, but they also had a sex slave trade of women Boys, girls, and also men. Right. Okay, so this is dealing with their history. Go ahead, quickly. 
Yes, that's why I think, you know, the, I look at colonization because as they set up colonization from the human Africans out of Egypt and pushing them down into parts of South Africa and other parts of Africa, mm -hmm. the same colonization is used on us today in this country we are, that we are forced into certain areas or locations, colonize and we shut off from the, uh, you know, the knowledge base and uh, oh, absolutely. The educational base. And, this, still, this process is still going on. It's so evident. You know, oh, absolutely. Well, it's evident to some people. And some people are so ignorant, they don't see. Okay, see, see, power is the ability to define and shape reality and have other people accept your definition of reality as if it were their own. Okay, this is what power is. Uh, as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, you don't, have to be, you don't have to be Muslim to gain wisdom from some of the things he said. When you control the radius of a man's thought, you can control the circumference of his actions. See, the mind can't do what it doesn't know. So when you, when you control the access that people have to information, not only can you predict. Huh? No, that's right. Oh, okay. Oh, you're clapping. Okay. <laughs> A finger clap. Okay. Not only can you predict, not, not only can you influence their behavior, but you can predict their behavior also. Okay? When you control the access to information. So this is what's going on.